every dollar on this planet is owned by somebody. So what you're trying to convince people with a brand new business is that they should start diverting money they own to you. And it's really simple because if you start with the wrong perspective, you'll make the wrong choice. I'm not out to hurt anyone's feelings, but between politically correct or correct, I'll choose the last. Hello and welcome to the Chris F. Walker Podcast. This is episode six and I am your host, Chris F. Walker. This is going to be a little bit longer podcast than normal, but I want to thank you for spending some time with me today because we're going to be talking about a topic that ultimately is going to be giving free advice that is normally charged for. Today, we are actually going to be discussing what are the five things that create a good business owner. Not the business itself. What does it take as a good business owner to be successful? A lot of times when people are starting to, to set out on their own for creating a business, they have a desire, a dream, a hope, an aspiration. They have this great idea, you know, up in the clouds of where they want to get to, but what they don't really know is how to get to it. And so they'll usually, if uh, they hire someone out to do a consulting work or a coaching kind of work. That's what they're hoping the person's going to bring to the table is the how-tos because it's not easy to make a business and no, not everyone can do it. And you see, the reason I'm bringing up this topic today is because as much as it pertains to business, the reality is it actually applies to a lot of aspects in our life. And what I mean by that is we're not going to be talking today about what it makes what makes a good marketing strategy or what exactly is your demographic and how do you determine it, what is your market share. Those are all things that have to do with business, don't get me wrong. But when it comes to starting a business, most people try to start in the wrong places. And they'll start with, well, I've got this idea, I've got an idea of a good product, or I think there's a service that's needed, and they say, as long as I can provide a good, vo a good version of that and market it well enough, then people will buy it and I'll be successful. And it's not that simple. In fact, if it was, then what that would mean is all it takes to create a good successful business is a good idea and some money backing to make sure that there's a marketing campaign and everything will work. But that's just not how it works. Uh, you see, if it worked that way, then all the people who already have money and are looking to invest in businesses wouldn't need to scrutinize the businesses themselves. They would just say, hey, since this person has an idea, all I have to do is throw money into it and the marketing will take care of the rest. It's false. That's just not how it works. That is not reality. And what we're going to find today as we explore what it really means in the initial stages of building a business is that it's not about the business. The first stages of building a business actually come from self-awareness and self-development. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, but we're doing it under the context of starting a business. So Yes, this is information that's going to be vital to anyone at all, but if you're the kind of person who has an entrepreneurial spirit and you're saying, I want to get things moving, but I don't know where to start, this is a great place to start and it's free of charge. So I want to get into how we build a business from the concept of how does a good coach show up and help train someone to, be, to become successful. But the first thing is not to talk about the business itself. And in some cases, it's really not even to talk about the individual. What I want to do first, before we even dive into those elements, is I want to break down a concept that was published by an author named Robert Kiyosaki. Now, if you've never heard of him, I highly recommend a lot of his work. He's very, very gifted at trying to help explain how personality and how our attitudes towards money, especially, actually create the cause and effect which will lead to either our success or our downfall. And today, what I'm going to be focusing in on is a, a four quadrant sum, uh, sum up that he designed and published. And so I want to make sure I give good props to where it's done. This is not my work. Robert Kiyosaki published this. And you know what? It's phenomenal. If you've never read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, highly recommend it. He does a great job of going into a lot of good principles about how we should think about money. But today, what I want to hit on before we even get into the business side of things is I want to explain these four quadrants of our attitudes towards money. Okay, so in the first quadrant, he labels it E and he claims that this is the employee quadrant. And that makes sense. You see what the employee quadrant is, is it's where most of us 
either start or, in all reality, will probably spend the most of our time. You see, the employee is someone who simply says, I have the ability to perform a task and I, w I am willing to do that task for someone else, provided they then turn around and give me value received in the form of a paycheck. So it's, I give and then I get. And the employee quadrant is something that we're all very familiar with. It's literally the majority of our society. We're trained on how to do it from school. You know, if you think about it in school, they have a school bell that starts at this time. And at that time, you better be in class. And then you're supposed to be doing all the work and the work are or the work's assigned and predetermined. And you know that these are the things that will be accomplished by the end of the day. And then at the end of the day, when the bell rings, you need to get out. You need to go home because God forbid you get overtime. And you see, those are the kinds of traits we're actually taught through our school system, even from a young age. Please understand, I'm not narking on it. I'm not trying to say that this is a bad thing. I just want us to understand that it's trained to us from the very beginning. So the E quadrant is, I trade my time and I get money. But the reality is we often realize that that's not really going to get us ahead. All it does is it gives us enough. It helps us sustain. But if I want to excel, then there's got to be something more. And so a lot of us decide what we want to do is we want to go into business. We want to become the business owner. Now, there's a next quadrant. It's south of the E quadrant. If you're following along with a, a verbal um, picture in your mind, the E quadrant is in the top left. Now then when we go down on the bottom left, what we have is we have the S quadrant. And this is what's called the self-employed quadrant. This is the quadrant for the people who have managed to not just create a way to, to do a task and get money, but they actually own the rights to it. Uh, for example, someone who maybe is a good chef and then created a restaurant. Now, the restaurant has gonna, is going to involve a lot more than just cooking, and that's what they're good at. But there's, there's other elements involved now, but the good news is it's yours. You own it. So whatever money comes in, you determine where it goes. But it also means it's now your job to determine, if there's other people helping you with that business, what their value is and how much money you're going to give them. And if you're going to provide benefits for those kinds of things. Those are all things that you have to take into consideration. Now, the self-employed quadrant is, in essence, a business owner because, yes, you have a business license and you're in business, you're operating, and you're, you're, you're relying on customers to keep yourself afloat. But what kind of screws people up is they tend to think of themselves as owning the business when, in reality, when you're a self-employed like this, it's really that the business owns you. You see, because what happens is everything that is required of that business is entirely on your head. So when the closing bell stops and the doors close and you're no longer catering to the customers, now you have to do all the back end stuff. You have to take care of your books. You have to take care of your administration. You have to see if there's any return policies that need uh, to be addressed. There's a lot that goes into running a business. And when you're in that self-employed quadrant, a lot of times people think that they're doing this because they want to, to free themselves and have more time to spend with their friends and family. But what they realize is that all of their time is now dedicated to this business. So you're probably making more money in the S quadrant. That's true. You're probably receiving more monetary value. But what you're not doing is you're not freeing up a large portion of your time because everything still relies on you. And so that leads us into another quadrant. This is called the B quadrant. This is what Robert Kiyosaki actually identifies as the actual business owner. And this is in the top right quadrant. Now in the top right quadrant, the business owner, this is the kind of person who not only was able to build the business and then that, and that S quadrant, usually they start off there, but they were able to then build it to a point where it now functions most of the time on its own. It's almost automatic. It just works. And what that means is that the pieces that are in place to keep it working are able to do so without your direct supervision. Now, there's a a good and a bad to this. Yes, you'll probably end up with a decent amount of money coming in because you're the owner. It's everything is on you. So the authority still lies with you. The responsibility still lies with you. But the problem is that the, the decision-making processes, if you really want to get into that B quadrant, that means you're going to have to let go of the ability to micromanage. You don't get to do that anymore at a B, at a B quadrant as a business owner. You don't get to do that. You're going to have to be able to trust that your team, your managers, all of them are going to be able to operate independent of you. And that's not easy. 
In fact, it's very scary. Because remember that if you're the one who built this thing up from birth and to where it just, it never uh, existed before and now it's in total creation, that's because of your efforts. So to then turn around and hand it over to somebody else is very scary because what happens if they don't treat it the way you think it should be treated? So you have to not only be able to make sure that it's going to run on its own, but you're also going to have to be at a confidence level where if someone does do something wrong, you're sure that you can replace them and repair whatever damage they've done. Because even if they did a lot of damage, it's very possible they could get away clean and you're stuck with the bill. So you have to make sure that the kinds of things are in place that will allow your business to run on its own, but you still have to remember that you're on the hook for it. And that's a dangerous place to be in a lot of times. You know, the idea of, you know, be careful what you wish for really plays out in business. Most people who really think they want to be a business owner and they think that they want to be in the B quadrant, ultimately when the time comes, are simply incapable of letting go of the control so that it can do that. And the downside to this is that they're not entirely wrong. There are people who will take advantage of businesses if they're not being watched. There are people who will think that this is an easy, quick uh, way to kind of get a little bit more for themselves at your expense. So it's a very scary position to be in as well. And then there's the final quadrant, which is in the bottom right. And this is called the I quadrant or the investment quadrant. And as we treat money, investments is actually one of the easiest ways to finally free ourselves from the burden of time. Because what happens is we start investing our money into other projects and they start giving us return. As easy as that sounds, it's not. Uh, for example, what money are you using to invest? You know, a lot of times when we think about what our budget is, we don't have a lot of wiggle room in our budget for doing any of this stuff. So we really need to be a self-scrutinizing individual to decide whether or not our budget allows us to invest because we have to make sure our bills are paid. We have to make sure that we have our debts taken care of. Those are all things that are obligations prior to investment because we can't just invest in the hopes that the investment will actually overcome the debt. That doesn't, that doesn't work. Uh, if you've never heard of the author Dave Ramsey, he, he teaches a great program about how to get out of debt so that you can start freeing up your assets that you already make. If you're in the E quadrant, you could already be investing in the I quadrant if you know how to use your money correctly. If you're making sure that you're avoiding things like debts and areas where it'll kind of create sinkholes, have you got the ability to sustain yourself if you do go out of work for a little while? Because if you don't, then you have no choice but to go back into debt, which means that you're pushing yourself backwards again anyway. So in order to create investments, you have to make sure that you're in a position to invest. And Dave Ramsey does a phenomenal program that talks through that. In fact, uh, the first three steps of his seven-step process are just getting you into a place where now you can start thinking about what it is, it is that you're going to invest in. Now, as far as investments go, that's not the point of this podcast. What I wanted to do with these four quadrants, though, is I wanted everyone to at least understand that our attitude towards money is not as easy as it sounds when we're saying, I want to be a business owner. Maybe you don't. You see, maybe what you're really hoping for is an investment opportunity, and there's ways to do that from where you already are. If you really want to create a business, though, then the question is, are you going to end up staying in the S quadrant all of your life? Or are you going to be able to let go when it comes time to go into the B quadrant? And if you do, have you set up things in a way that you can sustain a hit? Because anybody who's been in business will tell you, it's not about if you're going to get sued. It's about when a lawsuit occurs because something's going to go wrong. It always does. Business is just business. Things go wrong in business and you have to be prepared to handle that. So what we're talking about today is we're going to be talking about the five key elements about what it takes to get your business off the ground. From start to finish, what are the five things that have to be present the whole way through? And that's what we're gonna be talking about in detail as soon as we come back from this break. So I wanna thank you again for listening and we'll see you here in just a second. Stick around. Please don't forget to follow and review the show today. Also head over and register at the chrisfwalker.com website. There, you'll find links to the Indiegogo and Patreon campaigns, which help keep this show going. You'll also find links to the bookstore, gear shop, blog, and you'll stay up to date on upcoming events and live appearances. Now, let's get back to today's message. Welcome back to the show. Today, we're talking about the five key characteristics that as an individual are required if you're going to become a business owner, if you're going to become an entrepreneur who can build something from scratch to something that is actually sustaining not only itself, but even you and your lifestyle. And there are five key characteristics 
that every single entrepreneur has to have in place the whole way through, or it's very likely they'll fail. And what I want to do is I want to talk about these because they're not about the business. They're actually about the individual. They're about the person who's starting the business. These are self awareness concepts that are required if you're going to become a business owner. Okay, now the good news is that the first couple of these are actually very, very optimistic because rule number one, the first thing that has to be present is that you have to understand you do not need to be an expert in everything to make your success a reality. Okay, so what I mean by that is you are not required to be the expert in every field that is involved in your business in order for your business to succeed. What you need is you need to know exactly who you are, what your capabilities are, so that you can determine where you're best suited to run parts of the business and where your faults are so that you can then turn around and find the kind of people who can either help you through either their generous giving or by hiring a, a team member who's going to come in and fill that role. So, for example, you might be a phenomenal salesperson and that's what you want to do is you want to go out and you want to sell your products. Maybe you don't understand how to do the logistics or the distribution or shipping. Okay, those are things that you might want to hire out. Uh, there's actually ways to outsource a lot of that. With a lot of companies now, they actually have ways to do that. They'll do dropship programs. Okay, if you're going to in-house things, then you need to make sure that you have people who know how to do shipping. Now, so uh, with all those options available, it's just more a matter of you need to determine for yourself what you're good at and how is it going to be best fitted to your business model to overcome the areas you're not good at. Okay, and the other thing that you have to do with the same concept is you have to remember what it is that's the most time consuming and what it is that requires the most element and focus of your time because you're going to run out of time very quickly if you try to do everything yourself. So you're going to have to have areas where you say, I need to be able to focus on this, which means I need to be able to outsource that. Okay, so rule number one, you do not need to be an expert in everything to be a business owner. And that leads to rule number two. Rule number two is... You do not need to have the best product. Okay, it's a lot of times what happens is people will have a great idea for a good invention or a good, uh, a good service, and that what they want to do is they want to say that because I'm better than everybody else, obviously everyone's going to choose me. But the reality is that's not that obvious because everybody hears the same hype from everyone else. If you really think about a sales pitch, the first thing they say is, come try this pristine, premier, uber special, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. All the words and adjectives you want are not going to really sell them on the value of the product. And that is the key. The word value is the actual key. You do not need to have the best product. What you need to have is the, an ability to relate value to your customers. You need to have the ability to explain to your customers why choosing you is going to be the best bang for their buck. Because not everyone, you know, there's quite a few consumers out there who will not choose the number one best product because they know it's going to cost them too much. So they'll take number two because it's pretty close to the same thing and it's a lot more affordable. So you have to understand that what you need to identify first off is what is the value you're going to bring to your customers, not what the best product is. What is the actual value? What is the, the element that's going to give them the emotional attachment to the product? that they will then turn around and say, I believe in it and I'm willing to part with money to acquire it. Because that's what you're asking them to do. Trade this for that. I'm willing to give you some sort of a valued product so long as you're willing to pay the price that I've set for it. And if they don't believe that price is fair, they will not buy it. So value is the key, not the best product. Okay, rule number three. Rule number three, raising a business is like raising a child. Okay, you're not going to know all of the tricks and the traits as you start out. Get it. Okay, everybody gets that. You're not going to be an expert. We already said that in rule number one. You don't have to be. But you need to understand that the other thing is the business is going to go through the stages of business. Business is business. You've heard that over and over again probably throughout your whole life. And it's not wrong. You see, business is like a child. It has a growing stage. In its infancy, it is incapable of doing anything on its own. You have to be there to nurse it, to care for it, to make sure that its, uh, its schedules are adhered to. And that's going to mean a lot of sacrifice on you and your time. It is inevitable you have to put that kind of effort into a business if you're the one at the helm. Okay, and the other thing, though, is that even once it becomes old enough to start doing a few things for itself, that doesn't mean it's successful yet. 
The business is not successful until you have trained it and taught it to be able to function entirely on its own away from you. And that way, all you're really doing is checking in on it every quarter to give it a good holiday brief. You know, think about it that way. You just want to say, hey, I want to see my kid every, every, you know, three or four months. I just want to check in on it, make sure that we're going good. If you're really a business owner who's trying to create a business of complete entrepreneurship, of complete independence, then that's ultimately the goal. Remember that B quadrant we were talking about back in the first part of this podcast? The ultimate goal is to actually be able to walk away from the business. And that is what's later to investors called your exit strategy. So as we sit here and we say, remember that raising a business is like raising a child. What we're saying is, do you have it planned out from birth all the way to graduation to where it's going to leave the house? What is that process and what's it going to look like? And when your exit strategy comes, what exactly is it that you're sending the business out with? Because if you're sending the business out in a way where it's still reliant on you, it's not ready to go. It's not ready to leave the house. And that means to anybody who actually is interested in investing in it, it's not really that palatable because it's not functional on its own. Remember, they're looking at the I quadrant, the investment quadrant. So if they're saying, hey, I want to buy your business, they're not saying I want to be the business owner. They're saying I want to put my money into it so that I know I'll get money out. And that means that the business has to be able to sustain itself. So you have to be able to guide it from that process of birth all the way to graduation where it has an actual exit strategy. And if you never choose that you want to exit, that's fine. But you still need to have a process of saying, I know what it's going to look like through the, each stage of this all the way up until the point where it's fully functional on its own. Rule number four, you have to believe in your business. And what I mean by that is there has to be such a steadfast conviction that you're so convinced it will work that you refuse to quit. Because that's what kills most businesses is they run out of the assets that were needed because they poorly planned or they simply say it's too hard and I just don't want to fight anymore. You have to be fully committed to this concept. Okay, it's not easy to make a business, but there's also nothing more rewarding. Because once you've created something that is able to sustain itself and you birthed it from nothing, there is no reward greater that will help sustain you and your family than knowing that you were able to accomplish all of that through your own ingenuity and your steadfastness. But the other thing to remember is as you're going through the process of building a business, you will, you will, let me say that again, you will be told over and over again how you're not doing it right. You will be told all the things that are going wrong. Now, you have to be able to sit there and take in the kind of context of when people are saying things aren't working. You have to be able to listen to it, discern from truth, from just a biased, you know, informed opinion and make good decisions. But you still have to have a commitment to seeing it succeed. There has to be that level of you have to believe in it because no one else is going to. This is your baby. No one else's. You're the one who's going to have to believe it can succeed because when the hard time comes, you're going to be the only one that can see it through. And that leads us to the fifth element of a good business entrepreneur, and that is accountability. You have to accept that the success or failure of your project relies entirely on you. It doesn't matter who you hired it out to. It doesn't matter what circumstances happened to you. The only person at the helm who's ultimately going to be the reason for success or failure is you. If you're the kind of person who does not like to have that kind of responsibility on your shoulders, then business might not be the right choice for you. Because remember, businesses ultimately are for everyone. Everyone should have their own business. I, I think that would be awesome. But not everyone is for business. Not everyone can do it. It takes a very special kind of person to become a true entrepreneur who can push through the hard times because you're not going to make everyone your friends in the process of building a business. There's going to be people you come across who don't like your business, who don't like your products, and ultimately some of them who just don't like you at all. That's fine. You don't need to have the world love you in order to become a successful business owner. In fact, if we want to go a little bit of business talk here, usually once you've identified a correct market, you usually only need it anywhere from 10 to 15% to be able to create a sustaining, a sustaining business. And that's not an unachievable goal, especially in a local market. 
okay, where people are just kind of relying on you for their local services. Maybe you're a, a, a lawn care specialist or a plumber, okay, those kinds of things. You only need 10 to 15% to allow the business to sustain itself. And that's great news, but it's not as easy as you think to get that 10 to 15%. Because remember that this is a very important lesson to learn across every board. Every dollar on this planet is owned by somebody. So what you're trying to convince people with a brand new business is that they should start diverting money they own to you. And if there's no value in it, they're not going to do that. That's why rule number two is so important. Okay, but the main thing about rule number five is you have to remember, it's your fault. The business succeeds, it's your fault. The business fails, it's your fault. That's the level of authority that you need to take on this. It is entirely you. Okay? And you also have to remember not to hurt the family that you're trying to do this for while you build it. We talk about that in other podcasts, but I, I, I've really got to insert this one here. It is very easy for a business entrepreneur to want to create something and to be sacrificing every bit of their actual family life to try and create a business that they are convinced is going to sustain their family and then only find out that even if they succeed at building the business, the family has failed. You've got to remember to prioritize the rest of your life while you build it. You cannot ignore everything. Okay? So, podcast today was really focused in on an entrepreneurial spirit. What does it take to be a good business leader? What does it take to be someone who can create a business from scratch? So we talked in the initial stages about those four quadrants that were uh, published by Robert Kiyosaki because he talks really well about the different attitudes towards money. And those are very important to understand before you even commit to trying to build a business. Okay, and the second thing we talked about in that same element was talking about like someone like, say, Dave Ramsey, who created a great program that can help you get to where, as an employee, you can start freeing up some money to just do investments, because maybe that's where your heart really lies. You just want to have some of the money coming in, but you don't really want to take on the level of authority and responsibility that's going to come with a business-owning venture. Okay, so then what we just got done was we talked about the five elements that a good entrepreneur actually needs. So rule number one, you need to remember you don't need to be an expert at everything, and that's great news. But you do need to be responsible and aware enough to self-assess where you're going to need experts in what areas. And you also probably need to be very, very quick at learning because you're still going to have to learn at least a little bit in each element so that you can oversee it. Because just because there's an expert at the helm doesn't mean that they have bad motives. You still have to be able to spot when someone's doing something wrong. So you'll still have to be able to learn what to look for in all elements, but you don't need to be an expert in everything. Okay, rule number two is that it's not about having the best product. It's about creating the best value for your customer. Your customers need to know that the reason they're choosing you is because they made the right choice. So you need to be able to understand where they're coming from with their concerns, alleviate those concerns, and convince them why you're the right choice. And more importantly, live up to it. You've got to live up to it. Okay, rule number three. Remember, Raising a business is like raising a child, and it will have to go through all of the stages of life. Do not get angry because the teenager is rebelling. Okay, don't get frustrated because there's another diaper to change. That's what business is. You've got to go through the entire element of it because it's not ready to function on its own until it's gone through all the stages of life. In fact, a lot of times businesses that succeed very quickly often fail very harshly right afterwards because they did not put the right foundations in place to make sure that the business is capable of sustaining itself. Rule number four, you have to believe in your business. You're going to be the only person who believes on it to the level that you're going to need. So you have to be able to listen to other people's scrutiny because they might have some good points that you need to listen to, but you have to be committed and believe that it will succeed in the end. And that is not easy to do, especially when it comes through some of the hard times. Emotionally, we have to deal with a lot of our influences uh, of families and friends who are going to be watching it saying, why are you even still doing this? It hasn't been working. Those kinds of times come for every business owner, but you have to see the end in a way that they don't because you're going to be the only person who believes in it to the point where it'll push through. And that leaves the final rule, rule number five, it's your fault. Whether this business succeeds or it fails, it is your fault. You're the only person who has complete control and authority over every element of this business. So even when you delegate authority to somebody else for a certain element, it's still your fault that you delegated it. Remember, you're the only person who can take the blame. But you're also the biggest fan of the success when it shows up. Because nothing, nothing is more rewarding than creating something out of nothing.
I realize your time is the most precious commodity you could possibly share with anyone. So I want to thank you again for spending some of yours here with me today. Don't forget to review the message for others. And be sure to follow the Chris F. Walker podcast for new releases. Remember, your generous support on sites like Indiegogo and Patreon are making this show possible. Don't forget to register at the chrisfwalker.com website for links to the bookstore, gear shop, and to stay updated for new events and appearances. I hope to see you again soon. God bless.